Beloved, our text for meditation this morning will be taken from the epistle lesson, 1 Corinthians chapter 3. We'll begin at verse 1. But I, brothers, could not address you as spiritual people, but as people of the flesh, as infants in Christ. I fed you with milk, not solid food, for you were not ready for it. And even now you are not yet ready, for you are still of the flesh. For while there is jealousy and strife among you, are you not of the flesh and behaving only in a human way? For when one says, I follow Paul, and another, I follow Apollos, are you not being merely human? What then is Apollos? What is Paul? Servants through whom you believed, as the Lord assigned to each. I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the growth. So neither he who plants nor he who waters is anything, but only God who gives the growth. He who plants and he who waters are one, and each will receive his wages according to his labor. For we are God's fellow workers, you are God's field, God's building. Beloved, we continue in our series, Look at Me, and we are in Epiphany. And Epiphany is the Greek word for reveal and manifest, how God reveals himself to us, how God manifests himself to us. And we look at the visit, the, the visit of the Magi to kind of highlight the Epiphany for us in life. But what's interesting is that as we look at today's text, and we want to wrestle with making sure that God looks at us, that God sees us, that God is committed to our life's journey, is he still revealing himself to us? Or are we interested in him revealing himself to us? And what is important about Epiphany is that Epiphany was God's revelation to the Gentile community. And so we have these Gentiles bowing down before God, acknowledging that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. My question simply to you this morning is, is that still your reality? Is Jesus the Christ, the Son of God? And has he done anything for you to make you bow down out of reverence for who he is? This is the heart of our text today. Paul is challenging the Corinthian church as if they have forgotten who Christ is and what Christ has made manifest. And I stand, I know you probably know by now I'm walking around, but I stand traumatized today holding on to this podium because it made me think of the time in my life where I was robbed of my innocence. Two years back to back. One more painful than the other. At the age of 11, I think I have shared this with you because it's how I ended up with my British Knights. I almost died. My appendix ruptured, and I was fighting with my parents so that I could pay in our baseball championship. But the bed and the bathroom were not going to let me go. And my mother had had enough, and they had taken me to the hospital, and the poison had spread to my, le to my neck, and I was within hours. So, you know, as an 11-year-old hearing this, you begin to say to yourself, there really is more to life than playing summer league baseball. Well, at age 12, I went to work for Uncle Bill. <laughs> that was more traumatic than dying. I wish I would have died. <laughs> because it was at that point that I realized <laughs> My parents were no longer buying my clothes. <laughs> when you got to foot your own bill, I mean, you know, they made sure we had the necessities, but if I wanted some new tennis shoes, <laughs> that was all me. <laughs> we wanted some candy from the store, that was all me. There was no more hiding under mom and dad. That was back before you had to be a certain age to work or you had a family member, don't arrest me now. <laughs> there was no child labor, I loved every minute of it, but I came to age very quickly, that a dollar don't go that far, especially when it's come to a pair of tennis shoes. Do I really want those shoes, right? Kind of had to grow up, right? Near death one year, paying your own bills the next. I mean, it wasn't like my first electric bill, and that's still, you know. <laughs> but that's what Paul does for us, right, from verse three and four. Do you hear this? Did you read that? But I, brothers, 
could not address you as spiritual people, but as people of the flesh, as infants in Christ. I fed you with milk, not solid food, for you are not ready for it. And even now, you are not ready, for you are still of the flesh. For while there is jealousy and strife among you, you are not of the flesh and behaving only in a human way. He's telling the church in Corinth, he's telling each and every one of us, it's time to grow up. There's more to life. Watch this, even in church. than the death, burial, and resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. He wants to show you a little more. But right now, the way we're behaving, I can only give you some milk. Because we're acting like a bunch of babies. Hebrews chapter 5, verse 11 through 14. I, I want to get this. I, I, I want us to have this. And, and before we read this, i got to ask you a question because I want you to have some biblical context. Paul was with the people of Corinth for 18 months, right? That's about toddler age, I guess, right? If I'm doing this baby thing right, you're probably pulling up on the couch, getting ready to take a few steps. You may have even walked by now, but you're crawling pretty fast, right? Paul says, enough of this coddling business. Get up and start walking. Hebrews chapter 11. And this we have much to say, and it is hard to explain since you have become dull of hearing. For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you again the basic principles of the oracles of God. You need milk, not solid food. For everyone who lives on milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness since he is a child. But solid food is for the mature, for those who have their powers of discernment trained by constant practice to distinguish good from evil. What do we think of that, huh? Paul says there's more to this. There's more that we need in life. And if you were to fast forward to Hebrews chapter 6, he will begin to lay out for you what the basic things of faith are. Time to stop playing church. So let me ask you a question. Wake up, I know, stretch. <clears throat> and you don't have to do show of hands. I don't want to embarrass you because it's going to hurt. Anybody been coming to church longer than 18 months? Paul says you should be teaching by now. Next week is your message. Next week is your sermon. Quit waiting on somebody to get up here and say it for you. Do you have a word from the Lord? Why do we have to keep spoon feeding you? Is this church thing real? Or are you just doing this because Paul's standing here, because the teacher's standing here? Or are you going to behave, and she'll fight me later, are you going to misbehave like Lisa when she found out I was going on vacation? While the cat's away, the mouse will play. I was like, Lord, what am I walking back into when I get back, right? Exactly. But that's what Paul is saying to the Corinthians. So are we only going to do church because the teacher is here, the one who started the church is here? Or brothers and sisters, do you realize that there are some souls at stake and you've got some work to do? Crack open the word and let's get serious. And so Paul is kind of challenging them because your soul's at stake. What happens if your spiritual appendix ruptures? What happens? Okay, so I was talking about tennis shoes. What happens when you get that first credit card bill and you know you can't send that back to Cleveland? Man, I'm down here in Cincinnati, they can't foot this bill, really? <laughs> right? What happens when you realize, what, what do you draw on? What are you holding on to? You are still of the flesh. Now, I, I want you to watch verse 3 because Paul shows them how much in the flesh they really are. For you are still of the flesh for while there is, and, and, and if you were studying this, you know, getting prepared to teach, I'm going to prepare you since we're in it, right? I want God to be able to look at you. I want God to be able to look at me. I want God to be able to look at us. 
For there is jealousy and strife among you. Are you not of the flesh and behaving only in a human way? Now, some of you were bold enough to raise your hands that you've been in church longer than 18 months. You ever seen any jealousy and strife? <laughs> what color is the wall going to be? What does that have to do with the gospel? But let's fight about it, right? Jealousy and strife. Hmm. You ready? Galatians chapter 5, verses 19 through 21. Galatians chapter 5, verses 19 through 21. Now the works of the flesh, right? Because Paul just shared with us in verse 3 of 1 Corinthians, you are still in the flesh. So we want to look at what the works of the flesh are. I'm going to try to help us grow up because we're about to do some major work. Now the works of the flesh are evident. Sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy. You hear those words? Strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. I warn you, as I warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. <sighs> Did we get that? So let's go back for a moment. I, I'm going to stay in, in, in Galatians chapter 5 because I want to show you what the works of the flesh do. Now, the works of the flesh are evident. Sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery. Now, watch this. Enmity, which is division, comes from strife and jealousy. And if you're, you've got division, you've got strife, you've got jealousy, guess what offer you have? Fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, and divisions, right? No, we want the wall yellow. We want it blue. They voted to do what? So let me count those off for you. Enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissension, and divisions. That's 46% of the things of the flesh. Married to an educator, son of two educators, <laughs> son-in-law of an educator, been in school way too long, right? 46%, you know what that is? The church is failing. <laughs> We failed. We missed the mark. We're acting like babies. Like, we're acting like freshmen in Father Albert's class at Benedictine High School. Two and four, gentlemen, your seats should be four rows apart, two squares apart. Quit acting like a bunch of babies, all of you. That's what Paul is saying to us. Spiritually, is this really what we're doing in God's house? And we wonder why he's not looking at us. So let's have some application. Don't just make it about church. Where do you have that in your personal life? And you see the roadblocks. You see nothing's advancing. And Paul is saying by now, somebody, somebody ought to grow up and act like a servant of God. Because he's only talking about two things in these eight verses, nine verses. Are you a servant? And what is your soil like? We'll get to the soil in a, in, in a few minutes. So what we do is we create those divisions. I follow Paul, I follow Apollos. Are you not being merely human? We form cliques in the church. And you know what we do? You know the word very well. What's it? What, what, what's the word? They. <laughs> you, you already told me you've been here longer than 18 months. You is they. <laughs> They, and, and that's how we block things from advancing in the kingdom of God. When does it become brothers? When does it become sisters? When do we become a family of God working for the same thing? Paul goes on to break it down for you. He says, Paul and Apollos are one. You've heard it a million times, right? Teamwork makes the dream work. We've got to be in a position where we understand that all of us, all of us are smarter than one of us. I need you to disagree with me. I need you to show me the other side, right? The Bible says iron sharpens iron as one man sharpens another. We've got to be able to spiritually disagree so that we can advance the kingdom. 
I'm not right, you're not right. Who's right? God. And so, are we prepared to be available to what God is calling us to do? And so Paul begins to unpack this for us. If you're talking about Apollos, if you're talking about Paul, or if you're talking about how the church used to be under one pastor or another, you're missing the point. Because if we break this word down, it's not just minister, it becomes deacon, which becomes a servant. Who's bold enough to say they're not a servant of God? Thanks, good morning, glad you participated. <laughs> right? If we're all servants of God, We've got to put our egos down and let's just get to work. How do we make this happen? And so Paul is telling them, you're focusing on the wrong things. That's childish behavior. That has nothing to do with a kingdom mentality. I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the growth. Newsflash, we all have work to do. We all have a job to do. Ephesians chapter 4 kind of things, right? He gave some to be apostles, some to be teachers. You couldn't be like me if you were my twin, and vice versa. But we've got to do what God has called us to do. Why is that important? Anybody made the connection? Paul planted, Apollos watered. What happens if Paul don't plant? There's nothing to water. If you don't do your job, if you refuse to do your job because Brian has on a pink shirt today, you're not hurting Brian, you're hurting the kingdom of God. Bob has been waiting to water for a long time. But I didn't want to plant because I didn't like Sue's necklace. <laughs> right? So nothing happens. But guess what happens ultimately? If there's no planting, there's no watering. What was the third thing? God provided the increase. There's no increase. There's no kingdom growth. So, so you're at home, and, and those jokers didn't do what you asked them to do, so you're not going to do what you're supposed to do. And then God doesn't move in the house. Or at work, right? Right? I saw them walk by my cubicle. I don't like them. He has on way too much cologne. If she wears those red shoes with that pink shirt again, we're going to have a problem. <laughs> and so we don't do anything. And so we refuse to be who God has created us to be, and the kingdom stops moving forward. How is that acceptable? Paul says it's downright childish. That's a complete misread of the church. That's a complete misread of God's word. He who plants, he who waters, each will receive his wages according to his labor. Oh, well now, Brian, shut your mouth. <laughs> the beauty is that's not me, that's verse eight. <laughs> he who plants and he who waters are one, and each will receive his wages according to his labor. You sit there and be spiritually lazy if you want to. <laughs> uh, Uncle Bill used to tell me. So my brother and I worked together. And after we finished working, Uncle Bill would go make us lunch. And he would say, I'm doing y'all a grave disservice. Ain't nowhere in the world you're going to get it this good. I'm going to pay you and feed you. <laughs> right? <laughs> but if you don't work, his tagline phrase as he would go by and clean up or, or, or inspect after us because he, he ran some apartment buildings. You ready? What about this says, welcome. What about this says, welcome. Right? So you mean I'm supposed to bring my tenant up to this? And pay you? <laughs> no, man, get to work. Right? Do we think about that as servants of Christ? When people come to God's house, what about this says, welcome? Should God reward me for this? Okay, Paul already told you. There's some basic things. You are a saved child of God. Yes, heaven is yours. Okay. 
But now there's some deeper things. You are accountable for somebody else's spiritual journey. And what about your work? What about your labor? It says, come on into the kingdom of God. It says, this is some place you would really want to be. That I'm excited to be here, and I live here too. I received some gifts here. Oh, let's work, let's work. Luke chapter 12, verses 47 through 48. Luke chapter 12. And that servant who knew his master's will, but did not get ready or act according to his will. Y'all want to read that? (laughs) Will receive a severe beating. But the one who did not know and did what deserved a beating will receive a light beating. Everyone to whom much was given of him, much will be required. And from him to whom they entrusted much, they will demand the more. So I I, I am spiritually afraid as a pastor that many of us fall in line with the middle part of that verse, verse. Because one of the things my mother taught me about the Bible, and the older I get, I think she's right. She was probably my first pastor. God watches over infants and fools. Right? Because if you don't know, you just cling to God's grace. Like, oh, I got through that. I didn't know. But as you read the Bible, you become accountable for those things that you know. And I think spiritually, we just try to coast by and maybe I'll grab something from Brian on Sunday. Maybe I won't. Right? But did you hear how he finished? To whom much is given, much is required. You've already confessed to me several times over the past month you've had more than your daily bread, so I know that you have more than enough. I see you this morning. I see you breathing. So God is sustaining you. Have you ever considered what's required of you? I know we don't like to ask those questions because that, that, that sounds like works righteousness and those kind of things. But as you think of the goodness of Jesus and all that he's done for you, are you giving back to him a portion of what he's given to you? I mean, imagine. I mean, I know some of us have been doing this a long time and we utter the phrase, I'm tired. Could you imagine? Imagine if God said that to you this morning. Could you imagine if he said that to me this morning? I've been taking care of Brian. I'm tired of that kid. He's entrusted us with something. He has gifted you. I know you all are a bunch of re-gifters, you know. So it's kind of hard, but when you really get that gift that you've asked for, right? You ask for it and they got it for you. That's a beautiful thing. And you want to use it because it's something you really want it. And I try to shoot for that thing that I know costs more than I really would spend. So I think, right? Right? And that's what God has done for us. He's given you that gift and he's entrusted it to you. And he says, I'll reward you accordingly. Can I tell you where churches and, and, and people fall short? We never, ever truly estimate how much it's going to cost to pull it off. You know what we do? We say, here's a ministry, and we go to it, and we can't figure out why it didn't go. Because we really didn't calculate the cost. It was one thing to start it, right? But I got to keep showing up to this every week. Good grief. Every day. And then we hit them with this one. Can't we pay somebody to do that? I just want to come to church. But in our lives as well, God has gifted you to do something. And it sounds good at the start. But once I get to it, and we can't figure out why it just doesn't turn the corner, that's what he's asking us to do. He will reward us based on how we perform at the task. And so here's how Paul closes. And I will too, and you can get excited and figure this out. For we are God's fellow workers. How many of you have ever considered that you're a co-worker of the Lord? 
that God is your coworker. Yikes. That might change how you talk. <laughs> I'm just saying, I heard you on your way over here when you got stopped by the train. <laughs> right? When they cut you off. <laughs> right? That might change how you behave because when you realize you're working with God, there's something we all should take note. It's going to work out, whatever it is. <laughs> But watch this. You are God's field. You are God's building. So we can't make this about Apollos and we can't make this about Paul because Paul tells us in Romans chapter 10, verse 17, that faith comes by hearing. So as long as there is a word, your faith should be growing. Your faith should be developing, regardless of who it is. I could just stand up there and stand behind there, and as long as I'm giving you a word, there should be some faith connection. I know I try to keep you awake by walking around and myself too, you know, just that's how I think, right? Somebody just standing there talking to me, good night. Hard enough staying awake walking, right? Paul says, you've got a word. Now what is happening to that word? So I'm gonna close you with a little bit of homework, Mark chapter four. We'll do verses three through nine. Paul is explaining that whatever you heard from him or Apollos was the word, and that word should inspire you. That word should compel you to advance the kingdom. Ready? Listen. A sower went out to sow, and he sowed some seed, and it fell along the path, and the birds came and devoured it. Other seed fell on rocky ground, where it did not have much soil, and immediately sprang up, since it had no depth of soil. And when the sun rose, it was scorched, and since it had no root, it withered away. Other seed fell among thorns, and the thorns grew and choked it, and it yielded no grain. And other seeds fell into good soil and produced grain growing up and increasing and yielding 30-fold and 60-fold, excuse me, and 100-fold. And he said, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. In eight verses, Paul has simply told us, grow up. He's encouraged us to go to another level in our faith. He's asking us to examine all of life. The innocence has been ripped off. Yes, we got it. Jesus Christ and him crucified. But when you get some word, there ought to be a spiritual response in our lives. And that response is based on what kind of soil you have. Is this just something you do because you've been here longer than 18 months? Or is it something you hear on Sunday and by the time you get to your car because you saw those red shoes and pink shirt again, it choked the life out of you? Or they voted against what you wanted to do and it choked the life out of you? Or do you begin to understand that this all happens because of God's grace? Has nothing to do with any one of us. This grows because of God's grace. This moves because of God's grace. And as I evaluate my life and the drama that takes place in seven days, what makes you think Jovita didn't have some drama in her seven days? And she just wants to come to church to hear a word, to rest in her soil. I mean, I gotta come here and fight with Mike and Debbie. I'd rather just go sit with Bob and Sue. And we've got to understand that. This shouldn't be a place of flesh. This should be a place of healing and love and welcoming to each and every one of us. And not just to us, but for the kingdom of God. Because he finished by saying, you are God's building. And somebody wants to come to this building and meet the soil that's been planted the soil that's been watered, the soil that's been fed, and prayerfully the seed that has grown in that soil is nothing but Jesus Christ and him crucified. And every time somebody enters the building, enters your presence, they should see the tree of life, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray, amen. amen.
And may the peace of God, which surpasses all human understanding, guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Amen.